So we're continuing in our series of messages uh, from the book of John. Uh, the message became flesh. And um, we've arrived at one of the very famous passages uh, in this book, uh, very well known. Uh, and at, before we launch into it, um, I wanted to say some words just about uh, kind of our, our religious uh inclinations. Uh, you know, people the world over are religious. Uh, and they, I think the big question is, what is it we're looking for when we become religious, uh, when we devote ourselves to learning rituals and uh, requirements that we feel like God expects from us? Uh, so the Jews in the first century were experts at this. They had devoted themselves to really pursuing and digging into what exactly is it that uh, God requires of us in his law. They had numbered all the commandments that they found throughout the Old Testament and came up with 613 commandments. And they had devoted themselves to uh, figuring out how to keep each one of these commandments. And they had even added practices that weren't specifically spelled out in God's word because they felt like these were ways to ensure that they were doing uh, what God wanted from them. Um, and uh, they had been very meticulous about keeping every detail of what God expected of them. They were extremely religious, but uh, perhaps they weren't finding uh, what they were meant to be finding in all of this. Uh, and I think that Jesus wanted to teach us uh, in this first sign that he performed uh, that uh, there's a different way to go about all of this. And we're looking at that, this first sign that Jesus performed at a wedding in Cana. I have uh, titled today's message, uh, Stone Jars and Fine Wine. We are in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Um, and let's, let's go ahead and, and get right into the passage. Uh, beginning here in uh, verses one through five. And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and Jesus' mother was there. Now Jesus was also invited to the wedding and his disciples, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother says to him, they have no wine. And Jesus says to her, ma'am, what does this have to do with me and you? My hour has not yet come. His mother says to the servants, do whatever he should tell you. So we move in, in the gospel here to uh, a very um, community type event. Uh, Jesus is attending a wedding and uh, the Jews in the first century certainly knew how to celebrate a wedding. This was the kind of celebration that could easily last a week uh, and people would, uh, would gather, the whole community would gather. And if you think about it, uh, if there are things that as a community you want to really celebrate and really be invested in, uh, marriage is just that kind of thing. I know that today we've uh, perhaps reached a point where marriage is largely uh, devalued uh, and perhaps dismissed by many as uh, use, useless or unimportant. And people uh, today seem to, to go through marriages oftentimes. Uh, many marriages and, and uh, marriage seems very impermanent. But if you think of a society and think about the building blocks of a society, what is the, it, it, you know, like you think of a human body. If you get down to the most basic building block of the body, the human cell, uh, when you talk about society, you break it down to the most basic building block of uh, society and you end up with marriage. This connection uh, between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, and coming together to build a household, a home. Uh, so th th they, this was something that they celebrated uh, and the whole community was involved in it because they understood that this is uh, crucial to the health uh, of the whole community. Uh, that uh, from the health of a marriage and a family unit, that pr uh, translates outward into the health of the overall community. So this is that kind of an event, uh, a very common event. Uh, many, many people, in fact, in Jewish uh, thought, uh, 
men really had to get married. Uh, they, they considered the idea of, of be fruitful and multiply to be a commandment. And it was a requirement, if it was at all uh, possible for you, uh, to get married and to bear children and to uh, do this as, a, as part of your life of honoring God. So the Jews' uh, weddings were, were a very common thing in Jewish life. And think about that, uh, that they would spend a week celebrating these things. Uh, that tells you a little bit about the significance that uh, marriage had in, in Jewish culture at this time. So Jesus attends a wedding and his mother's there and also Jesus has been invited and not just him, but his disciples have been invited. They're all there for the wedding and uh, the celebration uh, and uh, something terrible happens. Uh, the wedding feast is not over. Uh, I don't know how many days into it we might be at this point, but before the feast is finished, before people have already said their goodbyes and left, they run out of wine. And this was uh, a, a huge deal in terms of social expectations. You know, it, it, it was mortifying uh, for the hosts to run out of wine. And we can imagine that. It's like having people over and, and running out of food. Um, and wine was synonymous with celebration. It was the drink that uh, was associated with gladness and joy and uh, just uh, spending time together. Uh, all of these kinds of things uh, were connected to wine. And you were expected as a host to provide enough wine for your guests. Uh, now, obviously, with a wedding, a big thing like this, you, it might be hard to gauge how many people are going to show up, uh, how much they're going to eat and drink. And uh, you can see this kind of thing can happen to you. You, you don't quite gauge well. Uh, so most hosts would probably overdo it. You make sure you have more than enough because you don't want to go through the embarrassment of uh, running out of wine or food before the end of the feast. So socially, this would be a great embarrassment to the host uh, to run out of wine. And, you know, you would probably face uh, humiliation in your local town for, for years to come for something like this. And there might even be uh, uh, greater repercussions because the groom's family was required to provide this feast and it was part of the marital arrangements. So if you failed in that, uh, there might be some expectation of, of, of uh, making amends of some sort from the bride's family, uh, that it was considered a, a requirement, a responsibility of the groom's family. Um, so that there, we can, we can imagine easily that this is the kind of thing uh, you don't want to happen. You don't want to have a bunch of people over for this week-long feast and run out of wine before you're done. Uh, so Jesus' mother apparently knows this is happening before other people find out, clearly before the master of the feast finds out, before the, uh, the master of ceremonies at this feast, before he's made aware of it, Jesus' mother finds out, which tells me she's probably either a very close friend of the family and therefore is very intimately connected to the family, or maybe she's even involved in some of the catering duties at this feast. Uh, maybe she was in the kitchen helping coordinate things in some way. And uh, uh, as we look here at verse 5, that kind of seems to be the case um, because she gives instructions to the servants as to what they need to do. So she's clearly very intimately connected with this family. And uh, I would guess Jesus growing up with her, uh, these are close friends of his as well. He knows them well. And uh, they've run out of wine. So Jesus' mother tells him they have no wine. Now, I love this about Mary's approach to all of this. Uh, she doesn't offer Jesus any suggestions as to what he has to do about it. She just lets him know this is the problem our hosts are facing. They are facing uh, tremendous social embarrassment. They're facing uh, this uh, time of celebration becoming a bitter moment in their memories because uh, they will be embarrassed rather than joyful about this moment in the future. And she, she just states very clearly that here's the problem. They have run out of wine. She doesn't suggest to Jesus what he needs to do, uh, but brings the need to his attention. I, I wonder how many times that's our approach when we uh, face a crisis moment like this in our lives. If we 
bring it before Jesus with that level of confidence where we don't feel like we have to issue demands or ultimatums or tell Jesus, fix it, um, but actually just share with Jesus what's going on and trust that he knows and that he can be depended on, that, that he cares and is moved by our situations uh, to act on our behalf in the best way possible. That seems to be Mary's approach to this. But notice Jesus' response. Uh, now, in other passages, when this kind of thing is said, what does this have to do with me and you? Uh, that's normally said in rebuke. Uh, and uh, literally in the Greek, it's uh, what, uh, what is this to me and to you, woman? That's it, literally how, how he says it uh, in the Greek. And, the, and the, the, the idea of that idiom is what business is this of yours or mine? Why should this have anything to do with us? And the idea when you say that to someone is, uh, and the expected answer to this rhetorical question is nothing at all. What does this have to do with me and you? Nothing. This is not our business. This is not our, our, our issue. Uh, and uh, normally you would say that to say, you know, you're kind of butting into somebody else's problems and uh, that's really not your place. Um, now, the fact that he, he says woman, and addresses his mother as woman. Now, today, if if uh, I, you were to address your mother that way, she would probably not appreciate it. Uh, in our culture, that's uh, that's not a respectful way to refer to someone. But in in the first century, that was a, a, an address of respect. Uh, and Jesus often in his in his interaction with women will will address them as woman. And that's not. Uh, a sign of disrespect, which is the opposite, uh, probably closest to our use of, of saying ma'am. Uh, and some might suggest, well, but even so, addressing your mother as ma'am seems a little formal. Uh, and, and some suggest that maybe Jesus is signaling that uh, he's launching into his cosmic role as Messiah and ruler of all creation, and perhaps he is redefining his connection to his mother in some way. Um, but it's certainly not a, a, a disrespectful way of responding to her. Uh, but basically says, this isn't our responsibility. And furthermore, he says, my hour has not yet come. Now, he doesn't elaborate. Uh, he doesn't say what exactly that means. Does he mean that if he starts doing this, uh, the moment of his death will come quicker than it needs to? Um, or is he just saying it's it's not yet the right moment to launch my public ministry? He's still in the process of gathering his core disciples. Uh, perhaps that's what he's talking about. Whatever, uh, whatever he has in mind, it's clear that for him to do something miraculous at this moment is not what he had planned, and it's not the optimal way in which he should go about his ministry. Uh, there is uh, something about this moment that it's not the right moment for this. Uh, I, I love Mary's response, though. She says to the servants, do whatever he should tell you. She doesn't plead with him. She doesn't argue. She doesn't nag. She doesn't say, but you just don't get it, Jesus. This is just going to ruin them socially. Don't you care about them? She, she doesn't say any of that because she knows that Jesus cares. She also knows that Jesus is juggling the fate of the universe. This isn't some little thing Jesus has come to earth to accomplish. He's come to establish the eternal kingdom of God and to change all of creation, the cosmos itself, forever. To break creation free from the power of sin and death. The stakes could not possibly be any higher. And what uh, import or what weight does the fate of one marriage celebration have when you're weighing it in the balance against the fate of the whole universe? She knows the stakes are high and that Jesus is dealing with something much more significant than social embarrassment at a wedding. So she trusts him to do whatever is right. And she turns to the servants. By the way, that word in the Greek there is the deacons. 
uh, yet another reminder that this word used in the New Testament that we get deacon from it, for us, it's, it's become a technical term. It means somebody set apart by the church for a specific office. But the way it's used in the New Testament is uh, it just means servant. It's not a specifically religious word, and it can be used to describe somebody the church sets aside to serve in some capacity, or it can be used to describe people who are serving the tables at a wedding feast, as in this case. She says to the deacons, to the servants, do whatever he should tell you. She just leaves the matter in Jesus' hands and instructs the serving staff. And again, that to me indicates that she's involved in the catering in some way. She uh, instructs the serving staff to do whatever Jesus tells them to do and leaves it in his hands. Wow, isn't that a great way to deal with crises? Bring them to Jesus and trust him. Actually have faith that he hears and cares and acts rather than wringing our hands continually and agonizing and pleading and begging and nagging to actually trust that Jesus knows what he's doing and that he cares and that he can be depended upon to do the right thing. Perhaps not always the thing we would prefer, perhaps not always the most convenient thing, but the right and good thing he will do. Do whatever he should tell you. Let me as a side note add here that uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition, much is made of Mary. And this is not found in scripture. There, There's no... Uh, guidance in scripture that suggests that we should somehow offer our devotion to Mary or our veneration in some special way, but people offer up prayers to Mary. People direct prayers to Mary, asking her to intercede on their behalf before God. Um, where, you know, the Bible says there's only one God and only one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. There, you don't need to appeal to Mary or any other person to get God's attention. Uh, but I would say there is one example in scripture when Mary issued a command. This is it. John 2 verse 5, when Mary said, do whatever he should tell you. This is the only time in scripture Mary issues a command. Uh, so if you are interested in showing honor to Mary and uh, in some way uh, showing reverence to her and gratitude to her for the, the key role she played in the Savior arriving in the world, then perhaps uh, the best advice I can give you is to follow her own instructions, which would direct you away from her and to Jesus. If you want to honor Mary, then do whatever Jesus tells you. Uh, that's great advice. I have a question for you from these verses we've been reading. Mary understood that Jesus can help and do so in the best way possible. She explained the problem and left it to him to deal with. How can we adopt a similar attitude when we face crises in our own lives? And let's continue with the next few verses, verses 6 through 10. Now there were six stone water jars there, appointed for Jewish purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus says to them, fill the water jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Jesus says to them, now draw out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So they took it. But when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that had become wine, and he had not known where it came from, but the servants had known, the ones who had drawn the water, the master of ceremonies calls the bridegroom and says to him, everyone sets out the good wine first, and when people are drunk, the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. So uh, here we are. Uh, how does Jesus respond to the crisis? Um, he could have said, you know what? The stakes are too high. We're talking about the culmination of God's plan for all creation. I can't change things to accommodate the needs of one wedding. Uh, this is too big a deal and the time is not right. I, I cannot do this. Jesus could have said that legitimately, without being cruel or mean. Uh, the stakes are so high here. 
But John, the gospel writer, turns our attention to six stone water jars that are there. Uh, they were appointed for Jewish purification. So, and preparation for the feast, uh, in addition to all the food and the wine and all these other things uh, that, that they were getting prepared. They had six enormous stone jars. Now, why stone? Well, these uh, were being used to contain water, which was going to be used for ritual purification, for washing hands and things, not simply for hygiene, but in Jewish thought. Uh, cleanliness was next to godliness. And part of the thing they did constantly was wash ritually so that they were considered clean in God's eyes, not to avoid uh, getting a disease or getting sick or anything like that, but simply because they felt that uh, if they were clean, then they would be acceptable to God and God would welcome them. Notice uh, how much provision they've made. Six stone water jars and each holds 20 to 30 gallons. So we're talking about a total capacity here of anywhere from 130 to 170 gallons. Now imagine the days before plumbing where these had to be filled by drawing water from a well and, and pouring buckets one at a time. That's a significant effort to have all this water ready so that everyone there at the feast can stay ritually pure throughout the whole feast. And Jesus turns his attention to these things. And this is what he tells the servants, fill the water jars with water. And they do, they fill them up to the brim. So we're at full capacity, as no less than 130, uh, as much as 170 gallons of water. And his next instruction may seem odd. He says, draw out, take it to the master of ceremonies. I wonder what the servants were thinking about that. Why in the world draw out some of this purification water and take it to the master of ceremonies? First of all, this water is not meant for drinking. This is ritual water. This water is set apart for ritual purification. It's not drinking water. It's, and I'm not saying by that that it wasn't uh, clean enough for drinking. I'm just saying that in the minds of the people handling these things, you don't mix ritual things with the kitchen. If you think about it in today's terms, uh, probably the closest thing in our nomenclature is uh, the religious traditions that make use of things like holy water. It would be like saying, uh, grab a, a cup full of holy water and take it to the master of ceremonies to drink. You don't do that. The, the stone jars with water, that, that is closer to synagogue and temple than the kitchen and the feast table. Uh, they're just things you don't mix. They don't, they don't cross paths. They're two different things. And yet Jesus says, take that ritual water and take it to the master of ceremonies. And I wonder if they thought, well, that's kind of mean. But that's kind of a rude way of, of making the master of ceremonies aware of the problem. Uh, you know, give them a glass of water to taste. Um, that, that doesn't seem right. Uh, but Mary had told them, and they did as told. They drew the water and took it to the master of ceremonies. Well, of course, the master of ceremonies, when he, when he tasted the water, and sometime, sometime between the drawing of it and the reaching the master of ceremonies, that water became wine. Uh, and this, uh, John will tell us, was the first sign that Jesus performed. And the master of ceremonies tasted it. And of course, by then it was wine. It wasn't water. He didn't have any idea where it came from. Of course, uh, John reminds us, those servants knew. <laughs> they filled those stone jars with that water. They drew it themselves. They knew exactly where it was. That was water when they drew it out. They had no idea what happened, but all of a sudden now it's wine, but they know that was just plain old water. Master of Ceremonies, all he knows is somebody just gave me some really good wine. And he says, this is... This is significant 
enough that I need to make some kind of a pronouncement for everyone at the feast. I want everybody to be aware of this. Uh, so he calls the bridegroom over. And this is something he's saying in front of everyone. This is a way of publicly honoring him as host. And he says it for everyone to hear. Everyone sets out the good wine first. And when people are drunk, uh, the inferior, you bring out the, the, the less, lesser quality wine later in the feast. Now, a uh, couple of things here. He does say when people are drunk or when people are inebriated or, or some people just say when people have uh, had enough uh, to drink or something like that. But really, he does say when people are drunk. Um, and I would add to that that really Jewish wedding feasts were different than Greek culture. In Greek culture, this kind of, and you know, obviously, if you get into the Dionysian stuff, uh, revelry and uh, absolute excess. I mean, just getting wasted and, and drinking far beyond what you should was a common practice in Greek celebrations, but certainly not so in Jewish celebrations. In a Jewish wedding, you don't go to a wedding to get drunk, uh, but you drink the wine. And if you drink wine in moderation, as the Jews would expect everyone to do, uh, and you don't get drunk and make a fool of yourself and kind of ruin the event for everybody. But if you drink in moderation, wine has kind of a relaxing effect and it, it, it makes it easier for people to just share time together and uh, enjoy time together. It kind of relaxes your stress and uh, perhaps concerns of the week and just makes the festivities uh, more enjoyable for everybody involved. And that's the sense in which wine is so associated in Jewish thought with celebration, with communion, with community, with gathering together and just enjoying each other. Uh, and that's, that's the sense of it. Uh, so I don't think he's saying here that the, the object of a feast like this is to get everybody drunk. That's not at all. But perhaps he's, he's overstating. He's using hyperbole here a bit. Uh, but you bring out your best wine first. Why? Because when you first come into the feast, you have a clean palate and you can more fully appreciate just how good that wine is. You start with the best wine you have because everybody is starting with a clean palate and they can savor it. Once you've been feasting for several hours, at that point, your, your uh, taste buds are kind of acclimated to the wine and the food you've been eating. And you really don't taste uh, as much. Uh, you know, the, the second or third cup of wine over a long, hours-long feasting period, uh, you just don't. Uh, catch the, the flavor as well. So it's normal. You, you want people to appreciate the good stuff when they can appreciate it most, care, most uh, they're best equipped to appreciate it. And then as they go on through the evening, you can bring out the lesser quality stuff and it's still uh, plenty good uh, for, for the ending part of the feast. But here's, here's the surprising thing. And I'm guessing then that the master of ceremonies probably didn't drink uh, he, he had to uh, keep his palate clean so that he's tasting things as they're coming out and make sure that everything is on the up and up and everything is right. So he, he's the one that wants to stop the show and get everybody's attention so that they make note of what's happening here. You have kept the good wine until now. So here's what I'm guessing has happened at this wedding. He started with the best wine he has. He burned through that and his poor wine his less inferior, his inferior wine. And now when you're expecting it to just kind of stay at that level through the end of the feast, he brings out a wine that's better than the wine he started with. This wine Jesus made, and of course, John doesn't spell it out. I, I'm, maybe I'm reading into it, but I suspect that was the best wine any of them had ever tasted. I would love to have tasted that wine myself. It, it just sounds like it would have been an incredible thing to be a part of, that God himself made wine for a, a wedding feast. Uh, what, what an event. And he says, you have kept the good wine until now. You have kept the best wine you had until the end of the feast. And the idea being, rather than trying to impress us up front and then everything petering out as, as is the uh, accustomed uh, way of doing things, the expected thing from you. We find that your, your uh, hosting 
uh, generosity at the end of the feast is even better than at the beginning. It doesn't dwindle. It just got better as the feast went on. And your generosity and your, 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 your making sure that everybody goes home with the best you had to offer rather than the other way around. Uh, and uh, it just, uh, I imagine the bridegroom was just glowing, you know, those kinds of words of praise. And of course, he probably had no idea where this wine came from. Uh, he's probably uh, wondering uh, why the catering staff did it this way, but he's certainly grateful that, that this has happened. It certainly raises his standing. Uh, now, uh, John kind of makes a big deal in his gospel about this. In fact, he spells out that this was the first sign Jesus performed. This was the first miracle. I find it very interesting that John likes to talk about these things as signs. Uh, he doesn't talk about them as miracles. Uh, the, the term he prefers to use is signs. And I think that's significant because a sign is something that points to something other than itself. And I think oftentimes we look at the stories of the miracles that Jesus performs and we think, uh, we think in very modern, in a very modern mindset, we, we're, we're kind of a couple of centuries into this extreme skepticism about anything miraculous even being possible, much less believing that God does miraculous things, that kind of thing. So we tend to look at these biblical texts and we look at the things that Jesus did and think that the point Jesus is trying to make is, look, I can do the impossible. I am omnipotent. I have the divine power to do things like heal, like transform water into wine. It's kind of a ta-da, look what I can do. But I don't think that's what Jesus is doing when he performs miracles. I think John has it absolutely right in calling them signs. So the point of a sign is not the sign itself. It's not just to say, look what I can do. The point of a sign is to indicate something other than the sign itself. It's to point us in a direction. It's to uh, signify something else. And really, Jesus' miracles, I think, all are basically kind of like parables they, they are teaching uh, things. They are, they are things that Jesus is using to communicate and to share something. And if God became the message in flesh in the incarnation, then everything Jesus is doing is about communicating something. And this first sign is an act of communication. It's not just an impromptu, ad hoc, let me get this friend of mine out of a socially awkward situation. Certainly he did that. But that wasn't what he was trying to communicate. Jesus used this very real moment of crisis and need in a friend's family and said, okay, I had not planned to launch my ministry yet. I was going to wait, but I will do it now because they have a need, and I'm not going to put uh, my plans uh, so far above that I completely ignore their need. I will adapt to their need and incorporate that in my grand plan to redeem creation. That tells me that's the way God works. He has this grand cosmic plan but he's constantly accommodating the piddly needs of my life in his grand cosmic plan. That's just the kind of God we serve. That's just who Jesus is. And to those of us who are involved in ministry, let me remind you, if the Messiah himself, if God in the incarnation, in the flesh, redid his plans for launching the most significant ministry ever to be launched on earth, to address the needs of a friend at his wedding, then perhaps we should do the same in the ministries we're involved in. Perhaps we should learn to accommodate the needs that arise around us 
and form our ministry around that rather than laying out this grand ministry and hoping that the world accommodates the ministry. Jesus didn't do it that way. But it's more than that. I don't think in this first sign, Jesus was simply trying to give us pointers for how to prioritize things in ministry. I look at the elements of this. We start with these ritual stone jars for purification. And I wonder, isn't that a, a perfect visual for how burdensome rituals had become in the life of the Jews. They had become so obsessed with getting God happy with them, happy enough to bring the Messiah. That was what everybody thought in the first century. The reason the Messiah has not come is that we're not doing it right. But the minute enough of us get it right, God will send us the Messiah. We just got to get our act together. And they obsessed, they numbered all 613 of the commandments and began carefully addressing each one and asking questions. How do we keep it in this circumstance? How do we keep it in that circumstance? And the rabbis are issuing their rulings and they're doing everything they can to keep every possible aspect of the law. To the point that you go to a wedding feast and they have to make preparations to have anywhere from 130 to 170 gallons of ritually pure water put in stone jars because clay jars are not considered ritually pure. Uh, it would have to be stone jars so that people there can stay ritually clean as they're going through this time of celebration. What a backbreaking burden the ritual had become. And that's the thing Jesus chooses. Jesus could have chosen anything. He could have had them draw the water straight from the well and turn it into wine. One bucket at a time. He could have done it that way. Why did he choose those stone jars and mix things? Those were set apart for ritual purposes. They don't belong in the kitchen. They don't belong in feasting. They're about dotting the I's and crossing the T's with God. They're about checking off the box on your offering envelope. It's that kind of thing. They're not about potlucks and wedding celebrations. But Jesus chose that and turned ritual into wine for celebration. He turned back-breaking, burdensome ritual into the best wine they had tasted this whole feast. And Jesus sat down. Of course, now they're out of water for purification. Oh, no. How are they going to keep God happy with them? Well, guess what? God is sitting at the table with you. He doesn't care. Jesus is signaling in this first of his signs how radically he's changing things. Forget dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Forget the back-breaking burden of keeping ritual. Let's embrace the reality of what God is trying to draw us into, which is a community of celebration together with him. That is what he's calling us into. And what better thing than wine to enjoy it and to rejoice together. Let's do away with the dry ritual and let's embrace celebration, a fellowship table with God. Let's dance and sing and rejoice together at love and community with him. Jesus was saying, this is the kind of Messiah you can expect. This is who God is. His first sign sets the ground rules for all that is to come. I have a question from these verses. Jesus' first sign contrasts dry ritual with celebration and fellowship. How can we embrace the joyous communal celebration Jesus invites us into and turn away from empty ritual. Let's keep reading verses 11 and 12. Finish the passage. 
This first of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down into Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and remained there a few days. So John concludes this story by telling us it was the first sign Jesus performed, and he did it in Cana of Galilee. Uh, there's no mention of this being a huge area that he spent a lot of his ministry time in. Uh, Capernaum, uh, he's in a lot. He's in Jerusalem, but Cana? Uh, and yet that's, that's where Jesus set the tone for everything that was to come. Notice how starting his work as public identification of, as Messiah uh, at, a, at a wedding feast, how that ties into the image we have for the culmination of his kingdom. Isn't it the grand wedding feast of the Lamb? And Jesus starts his ministry and calls us to a conclusion of it that will end in the same kind of feastal wedding celebration. God wants more than anything to commune with us. He wants more than anything for us to rejoice together with him. That is what he's calling us into. Not simply just dry ritual. And notice how John describes this. In doing this, Jesus revealed his glory. Jesus revealed his glory. This is what we're after. I asked at the beginning, why are people religious? Why do they go through all these rituals? Why do they try so hard? Isn't it because we are in pursuit of God's glory? In pursuit of something numinous, transcendent, far beyond something wonderful. I'm reminded of that scene in The Incredibles when uh, Mr. Incredible is frustrated and he comes home and he slams the car door and kind of crumples the car in the process. And he's very angry and uh, he does something that clearly indicates he's got super strength. And he turns around and sees the neighbor boy sitting on his tricycle and says, what are you waiting for? And he says, I don't know, something amazing. Isn't that what we're after when we pursue God? Something beyond the ho-hum doldrums of what we have in this world apart from him. Aren't we looking for more? Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. They put their faith in him. John has been is upfront about this. At the end of the book, he's going to say, I've written all of this so that you may believe that Jesus <coughs> is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you might have life. Jesus displays his glory for us to see, and what he is calling us into is trust is faith, that we will believe in him, that we will entrust our lives and hearts to him. That's the whole point of all this. That's the reason I preach, that we may see, not only see God in his glory, but that we will turn to him in trust, that we will find the glory of God have another question from these final verses. John tells us that Jesus showed his glory by turning purification water into fine wine. How does this inform our understanding of what should be the tenor of our Christian living? One of the great ironies in life is that we can be very religious. We can be so meticulous about observing ritual and about not doing this or that thing that would harm our witness and uh, doing this and that that very publicly shows that we're doing what God has told us to do. We can do all of these. We can follow every guideline. We can obsess about it. 
and actually never draw near to God. Never even know him. Never love him. When we focus on ritual, on the things we can do to earn something from God, we are ultimately still not focusing on God. We are trying to use God because our focus is still on ourselves. What can I get from God? Jesus, in his first sign, invites us away from that, from this kind of barter approach to God where we say, what do I have to give you, God, to get something from you? and just enter into a communion with him in which we fellowship and rejoice together, in which we dance and laugh and enjoy each other's company because we love each other. That's what Jesus is calling us into. Not more ritual, but that we genuinely encounter him and love him. Jesus shows us God's glory by inviting us to feast with him, to rejoice in his goodness, to enjoy him as he enjoys us. Guess what? And this is the wonder of it. God actually wants us. Who knows why? But he wants our communion. He wants our fellowship. He wants our love and our presence. Why would we ever settle for anything but God himself? My prayer for you today is that you know God in all his glory, as Jesus intended for you to encounter him, as he revealed his glory in this first of his signs, and that you will turn away from empty ritualism and come to know Jesus in the fellowship of love that he intends. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your love. Thank you that you have come to us and thank you that it is not the backbreaking burden of keeping all these rituals and rules and, and regulations that you are concerned about, but that what you are wanting is to draw us into yourself in fellowship together so that your goodness permeates us, so that the way we live, who we are, the, the quality of who we are is transformed, not by, not by rules keeping, but by osmosis, by your very spirit seeping into the bones of our souls. God, we pray for that kind of encounter. We pray for hearts that turn to you in faith and open up to you, ready to receive your wonderful glory into our lives. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.